Yo, what's up? This is Junior Sanchez, and you're about to witness and understand the past, present, and future. First record out was a sophomore in high school, so you're talking um, 94. And, uh, but uh, prior to that, prior to release my first record, I would constantly get off the school bus, have the school bus driver drop me off at the train station, which was completely illegal and you shouldn't have done to any kid, and then jump on a train and make it into the city before all the record labels were shut down, which would probably close around 5, 6 o'clock. So I get out of school at 2.30, be on a train by 2.45, 3 o'clock, be in the city in 20 minutes, and then go to every label. So I used to go to Strictly Rhythm, Nervous, Freeze, which is Todd Terry's label. Um, and f like, for example, I would, sit, I would go into the Strictly Rhythm office, sit down in their foyer, and sit there until somebody acknowledged me. Until somebody was like, what, what do you want? What are you doing? And you know, the first person that really acknowledged me at that time was Barry, uh, Barry G and then Gladys Pizarro. So he came out like, what do you do? I'm like, a DJ, I make records. Totally bullshitting, because I didn't do anything at the time. And um, they would give me promos. They'd be like, here, take this and play. And then, you know, from, from, from that drive came, and that drive and ambition came me actually DJing. You know? I remember hearing and watching Moby play and standing in front of him all night and not taking my eyes off the turntable. You know, but then I would, you know, digest that world, that Moby world, and 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 uh, Sven Bath, and you know, the more techno, you know, Dave Clark, and that whole thing. And then on a Friday, but then on a Wednesday night, I would go to Sound Factory Bar and hear Little Louis Vega play, you know, or Frankie Knuckles, and just you know, digest that that part of the world, you know, because I'm a househead at heart, grow, growing up in Jersey. So um, yeah, you know, the first experiences of me DJing were, you know, were just super fun and you know there, there was no there was no preconceived notions of success or where you were gonna go so you just did it because it was it was amazing to, it was fun to do I think the, the hardest part of uh, the hardest part of of, of my early career as, as a kid was um, the balance between wanting to, to live a creative life or a, a life of the night let's say and then still go to school and still be a son and have uh, parents that, you know, you, you, you know, automatically thought what you were doing was demonic or crazy or, you know, because I would dye my hair, I would go to Limelight, which was a church, and to my mother that was raised in a convent was like, what are you doing? You're, you, she thought I was going to Limelight to DJ and it was a cult. Like that, that was probably uh, one of the, you know, the uh, uh, hurdle in itself, but, you know, um, Everything in the process um, kind of evolved naturally. Like, uh, you know, you're young, you're not thinking about monetary things, you're not really thinking about money. I remember when I first signed my first record to Strictly Rhythm and I got a check cut. I was, you know, it, it was, it, I'm, for, the, for, the, for, for my agent at the time, I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. If I do one of these a month, I can live like on my own. Like, it wasn't even like, wow, I made it. I'm, it was like, damn, I can live. I can get an apartment or something. Like, there was, no, there was no, like, I had no idea where this music and this scene would take me. It was just like, yo, I'm gonna open a bank account now. And I can maybe help my mom pay some bills. Like, it was like, it, you know, it was like, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't crazy. It wasn't like, I'm gonna be a superstar DJ or I'm gonna do this. It was not, none of that shit was, you know, in, in, the, in the picture. I, I think how my life really, uh, took a change of course was I met Armand Van Helden early on when his DJ name was still DJ Aviate, not AVH, AV8. And um, he was living in Boston and he was playing a rave, I think, by uh, a mutual friend of ours, Tom Mello. I didn't know him, but I was at the rave and I was selling t shirts. I would do everything to hustle back then. So I was selling t shirts, I would take logos and change them. So I had the Burger King logo and it said Disco King. And I was giving them out or selling them at the at the at the rave and he saw it he was DJing he was like yo I like that and I think that's actually how our first you know interaction was made and he was like yo I'm moving to to New York I don't got really any friends or I don't know that many people so when I get out there I'm gonna look you up I was like cool so he did when he moved out here he moved up 30th Street the, the music building you know and he hit me up. I was like yo I'm having a party in my house like a little get-together like you know 
to inaugurate me living in the city, come out and hang out. And that party that I went to, um, everyone was there. Todd Terry, Roger Sanchez, Glass Bazaar. I mean, it was re retarded. And everybody was happy. You know, if you, if you know what that means. Everybody was really happy. And um, I went in there, I'm like, yo, this is crazy. And the first people I met was like, you know, Roger. And I, w I went to Armand's room and his girlfriend at the time was crying. I'm like, why is she crying? And you know, why, why is she upset? And my mom was like, she just found out Roger did Love Dance. And I'm like, it was the song Roger did. I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, it was like, this whole thing was surreal for me. I'm like, this is amazing. And um, that's it. And so Armand, I remember him being, you know, he was always he was always an amazing pilot. He's like my brother. So he was he took me by the by the head and was like, gave me a, a like a noogie and went to Gladys like this kid right here. This is the future, and that that was a catalyst for everything. I was like, damn, I have high expectations, so I got to keep it going, you know. I was already messing around at home on on a Roland W30 that Armand had taught me how to use, and then that really was you know I was like, let me let me get. Let me really dive into it because, you know, I was surrounded by so much talent and so much inspiration and all these people were like, you know, mentors to me in a way like I was, you know, Kenny Dope's beats were amazing. What, how, what Louie did from early on from Information Society was always inspiration to me. So I was just like, man, this, this is what I want to do. This is my calling. And I just went in and grinded and made records and, and the first record I did was the last new music seminar in New York City. We used to have a conference in New York. And um, I took the record. I had a friend of mine in high school at the time to kind of do the logo. It was like this, this, this caricature, like graffiti caricature. And I went to the Marriott and I handed it to Kenny Dope. He looked at it, he was like, yo, this shit is dope. Like, Thank you. And that's it, that's all he said to me, he took it. So that's how we do, we just pass our records, like here you go. You know, all that kind of like sublimity influenced me as well. Like being around, you know, uh, all the skaters at the time and then going to wetlands and seeing hardcore bands. I, I never understood, I never went like, I was never a genre specific person. I just love good music. So I would go and digest all this stuff, go to Brooklyn and be hanging out with Marauder, Saab from Marauder. And the next thing you know, I had no idea HR from Bad Brains is there. And me being a kid and all this, all that stuff kind of influenced me. And I realized that as I got older, because when I started making music, I started just kind of like infusing all these different styles together, you know? So yeah, we opened for Kraftwerk, we did a lot. Then, you know, I, I was releasing a lot of records and in, in, in 1999, I had a, a top, uh, like, a, I don't know, it was a top 20 hit or it was a big record in the UK, like top of the pop type thing, uh, or, you know, it was on the charts. It was called Be With You. I didn't understand this at the time, I was too young, I had no idea what how big it was, whatnot, I didn't care. I was, at, there was no sense of like, yo, I've had a big record on the charts. I was like, whatever. You know, and I was and, you know, staying in London at the Metropolitan, like that was, that was my like the routine. I was like, whatever. And um, you know, things were going really well. I started a label called Cube, Cube Records. And w one of my first signings to the label was Felix the House Cat. He was signed to FFR um, and he had just got dropped. Um, I believe his a &R was Lisa Loud, and then he comes to my house, and you know, I won't get really deep to the story, but he wasn't too happy. So I was like, yo, man, don't worry about it. I just started a label, let's do an album, hence Kittens and the Glitz. That record came out, was a catalyst for a whole movement of electro and that whole stuff, and my label Cube was kind of like, the mentality of Cube was, if I can play it, I'll put it out. So we had releases from myself, Stuart Price, which is the Rhythm Digitalis, or Thin White Duke for some people, you know, t you know, like that. Uh, Rhythm Masters, Steve Mack, Paul Wolford, um, Cashmere, which is not the Cashmere people think from Chicago. Cashmere is Tim Mason, you know, early on. So my, the label was, uh, it was an amalgamation of just what I consider to be the best of electronic music. But people understand that those three letters, EDM, it's not offensive to me. It's kind of like we got our own, those R&B now. There's a lot of, under, under those three things, R&B, there's, there's a lot of styles of R&B, or pop, or whatever. We have our own, like, we have our own three letters, and now we can, you know, say, okay, this is, you know, dubstep, and this is deep house, this is techno. So I'm not, I'm not offended by those letters. So I always had the, 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 the concept of just like, I want to put out just dope electronic dance music. He got, it, you know, Early, in the early 2000s, it got a, bit, a little bit stagnant for me because I didn't see the music evolving. Dance music wasn't evolving for me. 
So I was looking to, to other, not other forms of music, just other things. Um, because to me, electronic music is more than just what we perceive it to be. Um, Prince is electronic music. He did it on a Lindrum. Yeah, even though he's playing guitars, it's all an illusion, smoke and mirrors. Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails, which everybody would know, is one man in the studio creating all of this music on machines. And then he goes on stage with a band, but it's made by machines and him, but you know, it's electronic music. It's just, you know, you put a facade on it. it you know, you put a guitar and then it becomes something else. Or you know, or you put it on stage with a drummer with triggers and it becomes something else. The Pesh Mode, for example, no, there's never, they never had any drummer. They had triggers, they would go on tour. They made synthesized music. They just had a great composition. Martin Gore is a great writer. But when you put them on tour, you put them on stage, it becomes this thing called the Pesh Mode Band. Nobody really thinks, you know, in deeper than, hey, it's just electronic music. Uh, you know, I was, I was always into indie and alternative music, but I was like, ah, what if we infuse the two? What if I bring my attitude to what's going on in New York right now? Which, you know, um, I would go to Knitting Factory and then I would see Sarah Lewin in there and I'm like, I don't, I never knew her, but I introduced myself like, hey, you're a friend of Tommy Sunshine's. I'm a DJ, like I knew, like, she probably didn't even know who I was or what was going on, but we became friends and, and then, you know, I started hanging out more in that scene and infusing my, you know, electronic music attitude into the indie rock scene and, and it fueled me. So it influenced me when I would go to Pasha and Ibiza and play and then I would DJ and then I would kind of sneak in like a faint record and then people were like, what are you doing? That's not house music. So that was the first time I ever got kindly requested to stop playing. It was a Pasha Biza, I can't remember the year, but it was early on because I was playing, I was kind of, I guess I was a bit of a rebel, but I needed to be because isn't that how art is? Art is being rebellious. Art is pushing boundaries, you're pushing buttons. I mean, you can play it safe and that's great, but I never understood about playing it safe. I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to, I, I got into this, into this world, I wouldn't call it a business because I, I say a world, because I love music and I love the art, I love creating it. So I, I, was, I, I didn't want to be complacent and be like, all right, this is what's going on, let me do this. So um, that's, that's how I got involved in, 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 in that world and infusing alternative rock and indie in, into uh, to, to dance music. And then people like Paul Epworth that I became friends with inspired me. He had an alias called Phones. You know, People, I don't know if people who know Paul Edwards today, he, you know, he, uh, we have Adele because of him. We have Florence and Machine because of him. You know, all these records that, you know, we have Black Party because of him. But, you know, Future Heads, I mean, we, the list goes on and on. But, uh, yeah, you know, I was so inspired by that scene that it really, you know, it opened up my mind. The same way NASA and rave music opened up my mind coming from being a house head. So it was like different phases of my life. You know, what's funny, as I sit here and do this interview, I'm realizing everything goes in cycles. And I'm kind of at the same place creatively I was when, in, when I had my label Cube. Now I have a label called Brobot, and I'm having the same mentality. If I can play it, I'll put it out. And I just want to have a label that encompasses and showcases great music, new talent, um, and artistic integrity. I'm not gonna just release a record because that's what is happening on Beatport, or that's what's happening on TrackSource, or that's what's happening on any other channel. People think, like, what happened to Junior Sanchez? Well, I was remixing The Bravery, Block Party. I was doing a lot of work and working with bands and did Gorillas there, you know. I did a lot of things, you know, we, we won't get into the, to, 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 you know, that story, but when I decided to really focus on dance music again, I called one friend up. Actually, I didn't even call him up. We were at Armand Van Helden's house and he happened to be there that night. And it was laid back Luke. And over the years, I've, I've helped, I would say I would help Luke or, or give him advice or mentor him a lot in different cultures and scenes and all that. He, you know, he knows where I'm coming from. Actually, me and laid back Luke actually had a band called, together called uh, Riot Society, which is really funny. Um, me singing, we, yeah, yeah, there's so much crazy information. So I, I asked him, I said, yo, What's up? Like, what's going on? I, I, you know, I asked him for some, some advice. He gave me some advice. I went back in the studio, and one of the first records I did was "Where You Are," and with Shawnee, Shawnee Taylor and Harry Harry Romero and the Oxygen Technique. 
these are all the people that are around me at the time, so everybody we decided. Record was started, they came in and we finished it up. Anyway, the first person I wanted to reach out to when I had this record was Steve Angelo. Because um, I met him through Layback Luke. And, and I, was, I, I knew his work, I knew, I knew of the label, and I was a fan of what was going on. He was one of a few people that was kind of like really pushing, pushing some buttons along with Luke. And um, I had a record, I was like, yo man, I think I got this record I want to put out with you. He just sent it to me. Sent it to him, he was like, yo, I love it. And that's kind of where our relationship really manifested. And as I got to know him over the years, I realized me and him were kind of very similar in a lot of ways, because we care about the art. A lot of people don't realize because of, of the Swedish House Mafia uh, phenomenon that is gigantic, that he's he's one of the illest DJs, um, one of the illest producers, not just a beat maker, an actual producer um, that I've known in on my years. And there's certain people that I really admire. Stuart Price being one of them, the Rhythm and the Talist, the White Duke, whatever his moniker goes. And Steve's another. Not only, you know, uh, because of his production in the studio, but how he carries himself, his fan, the way he thinks, how he's a family man. Now, we, we kind of like, it makes sense to me. And um, he, he, there was a lot of inspiration there. So our relationship, you know, now is is this bro about size relationship which i had no idea he had told me at coachella two years ago he's like yo man i gotta tell you something i'm like what he's like i don't know if you know this but um cube inspired me to start size i'm like it did i'm like he goes yeah and he gave me the reasons why and it all makes sense to me i'm like oh you never know you're impacting people when you're doing it. like you know i had no idea and um and it, yeah so it kind of even gave me more fuel to start a label again because when I had Cube, I was releasing all this music, electronic music, but at the end of it, I put out a record by Moving Units. So people were probably like, what is going on here? I went from releasing amazing electronic music to an amazing indie rock band, but it didn't, co it didn't, it didn't, I, I, you know, it didn't correlate with people, it didn't, it didn't catch on. But basically, you know, Steve Aoki was doing that with Dimac. People don't understand, he comes from an indie rock background. You know, and now his label, it is what it is today, but you know, he, he was on that tip a long time ago. But um, that, that was a catalyst for me really pushing forward with Bro Body and starting to get in and, and knowing that I got pretty dope in our ears. I know what's, what's dope and I just wanted to see art happen again. Right now I feel like there's a lack of art happening in, our, in electronic dance music or EDM, house music, techno. I mean, come on, it's, it, it is EDM. It just stands for electronic dance music. So I'm not gonna say there's no art in techno or there's no art in minimal or no art in deep house, no art in big room. The, as a whole, our, our scene needs a little bit more art. And I feel like that's, that's, where, that's where I am again. I'm, I'm back into this, like, I'm, I'm finding, I'm finding my, my fuel f for being uh, a dope electronic music artist again. The future entails a few things. My label, Brobot, which I want to showcase, you know, um, pretty amazing electronic music by um, not only myself, but new artists, friends, colleagues. And uh, it's a partnership I started with Size. Um, Brobot is going through Size, and so it's, you know, it has those channels. And it's, and the model is gonna be exactly how I always had, how I had Cube. If I can play it, I'm gonna put it out. I'll release it. And then I'm also working on my, on my album, which I've been dying to complete for a long time. It's been through a lot of incarnations. You know, I've had a lot of different things, but uh, the, my album right now is tentatively titled Under the Influence. And what I'm doing is making a record that encompasses all my influences of, all, of, of my life and career. So whether it be a sample that's influenced me and I make a piece of art out of it, or I'm collaborating with people from the past that have influenced me. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of people that's gonna appear on the record uh, from all different genres of music that's really cool. And, and the first single we're gonna, we're gonna release from that is called The Future. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a powerful record.
Um, it's, 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 a, it's a simple record, but it's very powerful. And it kind of like really touches on what's going on today in, in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's, that's pretty much where you get to see the future is, you know, me, you know, pushing forward electronic music and helping you grow. And, and helping kids understand the art more than just the, the, the speedy um, monetary fame, vanity, venetious world that electronic music is in right now, you know, and help, help the kids explore their own artistic side. And you're gonna see me, you know, be more artistic with my album, which is called, you know, The Future. And, you know, you'll see me touring more, you'll see me playing, and you might have a few surprises, you, you know, you know, when I play out, you know, I'm, I, I think it's just time to have fun again and and not necessarily say go back to basics but go back to doing things from your for from your instincts and your gut as, as opposed to um, it coming from you know you have to do it because X Y and Z you know what I'm saying I could say a, a quick story like off the record or whatever it doesn't matter when I first heard B you know Steve Angelo's B I was going to Amsterdam a lot, and I always, I always would stay at Shiproll because I like the the Raritan there, the, or Sheraton at the Shiproll Airport, because it's in you're in there, you're in the hotel, and you're back in the airport. I don't smoke weed, so I didn't need to go and do shit. I'm like in and out. But every time I would stay there, Layback Luke would come visit me at the hotel. He's like, yo, so I would come and I would open my laptop. You know, he was in a weird place in his career at the time, and I was kind of like, yo, check this out. This is Holotronics, this is Diplo, this is, this is Baltimore, be more music. This, da, da, da. So I was constantly feeding him some stuff. So, you know, fast forward, you know, three or four times, you know, after three or four Amsterdam's later, I would get there. He's like, yo, check this record out. I'm like, boom. He's like, boom. Doom, 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 doom. I'm like, yo, that's some Baltimore shit. He goes, yeah, I'm playing a gig tonight. I did this record with Steve Angelo. Come out. And I was like, all right, I'll come with you. So I came and he's playing with Steve and they just had finished. I, B wasn't even finished yet. It was like a rough edit. And they played it and I hear boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, yo, this is crazy. I'm like, I'm understanding this. I'm like, this is like Baltimore, but like big. And it's infused with like, you know, techno and, Progress, I, I mean, the word progressive wasn't even in my head at the time. I was like, that was like a scary word to me. I'm like, and, you know, I'd learned to like it later. <laughs> but I was like, yo, but yeah, so you see these things happen from just hanging out, just hanging out with Layback Luke and him discovering Baltimore ghetto music inspired like a record like B. And it took Steve to, you know, their collaboration to make it what it is. Right. The only thing that remains the same in the future or music is frequencies. But even that, even the tonality change. So your emotions will always be there and the frequencies will be there, but everything else is new.